In this video series, we have been fixing Disney's Rise of the Skywalker. We're doing our best to make it a good and proper Star Wars movie through the power of established lore. In this part, we will look at the First Order Medallion and how a few ballpoint pens solved the same problem 30 years ago, C-3PO's refusal to translate the Sith language, and how the same thing was done properly in the past, the ticking clock that drives Rise of the Skywalker forward, and why it is time to punch that particular clock. It's kind of sad that we have to tear it down. Really? We built this amazing thing and now we have to tear it down? I'm standing here in pieces and you're having to lose the grandeur! You did it! Before the Death Star Rex sequence, there is another plot coupon to collect. This item is called a medallion. When inserted into a ship's CD player, it acts as a key. Medallion's good. Clear for entrance into Hangar 12. The plot calls for our new heroes to stroll around a fully armed and operational Star Destroyer. How could they possibly manage to do that? Well, this medallion is a ticket past all the logical hurdles to that plan. That's First Order Captain's medallion. I've never seen a real one. Free passage through any blockade, landing privileges, any vessel. But this is a new item JJ has invented, so let's see what already existed that he could have used. Have a look at these pictures. Notice anything these men have in common? That's right, they're all carrying several pens we never see them write with. Why would Grand Moff Tarkin need four different ballpoint pens? This object from the Star Wars universe is called a rank cylinder. It's a good thing they don't smell as rank as a trash compactor, because they are never far from one's nose. <laughs> Officers within the Empire's military would display these on their uniforms, next to any medals they might have. Since you are reluctant to provide us with the location of the rebel base, I have chosen to test this station's destructive power on your home planet of Alderaan. Like medals, having many rank cylinders isn't the same as being important, but both items do imply prestige and power, which I'll explain in a moment. Oh, I didn't know you had any medals. What are they? Three years long service, six years long service, nine years long service, twelve years long service. <laughs> in the Star Wars universe, there is no such thing as the First Order. It does not exist. When the Empire fell after the Battle of Endor, it didn't happen overnight. What was left of the Empire formed into the Imperial Remnant, a powerful faction for decades to come. The Imperial Remnant still uses rank cylinders, and the New Republic has equivalent tech in things like ID cards. Technically speaking, this cylinder is a dongle. To access restricted areas or files, you must insert your rank cylinder and key in the correct access code. Your permissions are linked to this, and the system records your every move. It also stores what we call biometric data. Fingerprints, voice, retina, that sort of thing. Of course, even the Empire has more than a few non-humans in the ranks, and many more as contacts. We can't assume every race has dermatoglyphic features on its fingers, or that it has fingers. Or, if it has fingerprints, that they uniquely identify an individual. As for why officers have more than one rank cylinder, that's one for each facility they have access to. You could imagine an Imperial courier ending up with several cylinders, despite the lack of prestige. Keeping them separate is an important security feature. Stealing a rank cylinder from the Death Star won't do any good on a Super Star Destroyer. Let's compare them. JJ's First Order Captain's Medallion allows anyone to access anything. The rank cylinder gives a specific officer access to what he should need. According to the Disney Wars trademark, data bank, registered trademark, First Order officers use data medallions to verify their identities while traveling with the devices transmitting encrypted codes. Such verifications help cut through bureaucratic snarls and maintain secrecy during covert operations. Quite right, it would seem. Very useful for covert operations against the First Order. Two sentences on this plot crucial item in the data bank, and a whole half of them are the explanation required for the plot. My hard copy references on rank cylinders span multiple pages, printed in 97 naturally. 
the original key solution in the form of rank cylinders has existed since the 1970s. Let's play spot the difference. Mrs. Leeds changing. Do you see? Mrs. Jacoby reborn. Do you see? Do you see? Yes, that's right. Those I maniacs finally really, really did, did it. it. They created a worse version of something that has existed for 30 years, and they did this while looking right at a better solution and erasing it. The medallion has no security of any kind. It works for anyone holding it. The rank cylinder has a password on it and support for biometric scanners. The medallion has no limitations on its use. It belonged to a ship captain who either had it stolen or sold it himself. Yet the First Order doesn't know a medallion went missing, whereas the Empire changes the rank cylinder passwords on a monthly basis. This writes a whole scene for you. Our heroes would need to get a rank cylinder, but not any old one. It needs to come from an officer stationed where they want to infiltrate. Tracking down this guy can take any path over any length of time. When you have the right officer, you then need to steal the correct rank cylinder. On top of that, you need to get the correct password for that exact dongle. Biometric security can be ignored if you want, or take up several minutes. And after all that, you have a ticking timer to use it by. The rank cylinder could stop working at any second the writers want it to. Using this instead of the captain's medallion not only gives more options, it looks better. It makes both sides, goodies and baddies, seem more competent. Clumsy as he is stupid. A deliberate choice was made with C-3PO. They decided to say that he can translate the Sith language, but that he refuses to. This is an obvious reference to Star Wars 6 in the Ewok village. That's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's a good reference to have, because this is the single best example of 3PO's character. You can say it's just programming, but that's still a characteristic of who he is. Well, why don't you use your divine influence and get us out of this? I beg your pardon, General Solo, but that just wouldn't be proper. Proper? It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. There are better ways to do the same job. This plot point does several things. The most important is a fake death scene, which is in itself another reference. It also serves to add complexity to the plot. One more hurdle erected on the road to the final boss fight. Plus, this introduces a droid specialist named Frick. Frick is cute as heck, arguably the most popular character in the movie. To say I've fixed something, the new version needs to better accomplish the same goals. Otherwise, I haven't fixed anything, I've just replaced it. These movies are not irredeemable. On the contrary, they are so easy to fix, you can retain almost everything about them. That's funny. The damage doesn't look as bad from out here. <laughs> are you sure this thing is safe? All it would have taken was a moment's thought from anyone involved. You don't even need an expert, just to listen to somebody who's moderately informed. Run all your bright ideas past him, half end with a veto, and the rest are reworked to be possible within Star Wars. Saying 3PO can translate but won't is the same as if he can't. Functionally, it changes nothing, except maybe subverting expectations. You bet you never predicted this to happen. <laughs> And once again, that feature is one that we can retain while fixing it. Does it make sense for a droid built for etiquette and protocol to speak Sithlish? Yes and no, but I reckon mostly no. He can figure out a translation for the Ewoks, and not because he knew it already. The language has similarities to the six million he already knows, and 3PO can learn the rest. New acquisitions. How many languages do you speak? I am fluent in over six million forms of communication and can readily splendid. The Sith were thought to be extinct for a millennium, about 50 years ago. He was trained in the Jedi art. My only conclusion can be that it was a Sith Lord. Impossible. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. Let's handle the complexity first. An obvious answer will be that 3PO can't read Sith yet. This gives the team an errand to run looking for a way to learn the language. That alone could fill an hour of runtime, and we haven't even started being creative. 
perhaps they can go to a museum and look at an engraved Sith tablet. Maybe it's gibberish, and 3PO can immediately tell this is a replica, so they break in and look for the original. Whatever they try, it doesn't work. Then, they track down the required component. C-3PO was built with a Tranlang 3 communications module. Times change, and that won't be top-notch anymore. Maybe they buy, borrow, or steal a Tranlang 4 module to replace it. Maybe a cantankerous archaeologist named Laraz Groft put together a module containing the Sith language. The most logical place to look for these parts is inside another protocol droid. The galaxy is not short on options. One we know would be compatible is a military M3PO, not a battle droid, despite coming with spooky red glowing eyes as standard. The M3PO is built to handle paperwork the soldiers don't want to put up with. Imagine its personality when talking to C-3PO. Another model, the PD series, is fully sealed and weatherproofed. C-3PO is better at his job, because the PD is also built for genetic manipulation. The LOM series is a cheeky copy of the 3PO by a different manufacturer. Not exactly handsome, but then again, I'm not in the target demographic. They are reasonably popular with the various insectoid races of the galaxy, a bit more calm than the competition, and we don't mention the one that's a bounty hunter. There will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. You are free to use any methods necessary, but I want them alive. No disintegration. Bounty hunters, we don't need that scum. Similar looking, there is the J-9 worker drone. People say they were made by the Verpine in Roche, but that's for short. It's Roche Hive Mechanical Design and Construction Activity for those who need the Hive's machines. The J-9 drone was a protocol droid, but only had a Tranlang 2 module by default. No reason one of them couldn't have been upgraded by now, though. Another distinctive one is the CZ made by Servodroid. These were built to be secure comlink and messenger droids. Its memory banks are so secure, you'd have to talk it into willingly giving you the data. We see some non-functional ones destroyed by Jabba the Hutt. Fit him with a restraining bolt and take him back up to His Excellency's main audience chamber. R2, don't leave me! <sighs> this one is CZ-3, after Jabba had installed a surveillance module. Look at this. Ever since the XP-38 came out, they just aren't in demand. It'll be enough. Perhaps the most likely to have a Sith module is the RA-7 personal assistant. These all started out in Imperial service, to the point Death Star droid means only this model. They were common, but not considered very good at what they do. Unless you're in the Imperial Security Bureau, that is. The real purpose is to spy on Imperial officers, which is useful right now. Suppose a Death Star droid had seen a researcher handling Sith artifacts. That might be enough for C-3PO to learn the Sith language. Or an ancient model, the SE-4, which make decent translators. They'll speak Bochi and Hatese, but might not know any Shriwook. However, there's already a slot on its chest for a skill module. This one detail makes it perfect for our purposes, as C-3PO doesn't have this slot at all. It's impossible to use a skill package from an SE-4 in a 3PO, not without a droid technician. R2-D2 and C-3PO are two of the most famous droids ever built. In the original lore, their manufacturers noticed and acted accordingly. Some 3PO series protocol droids are over a hundred years old. Where is everybody? Whoops. Hello, I am C-3PO Human Cyborg Relations. Now there exists the C series, from C1 to the C9. Cyborg Galactica has officially stated that this is not intended to cash in on C-3PO's fame. How rude! How does C-3PO feel about the new model to replace him? Is it any good? Wait a minute. If there's a new model, why drag this old thing around? Hey, this R2 unit of yours seems a bit beat up. You want a new one? Not on your life. That little droid and I have been through a lot together. Our heroes rush through the process of installing the upgrade. It doesn't work. Don't lose your temper. I'll come right back and give you a hand. C-3PO explains that the digital certificate on this part expired six years ago. Or worse, it's unofficial. He would not, could not, install this language pack without a license key. The team considers buying a subscription, but the Cybot Galactica head office is closed today. Or they just got taken over by the Empire. 
they're out of their depth, so finally they call Babu Frick. The technician can sort this out, thank Frick. The manufacturer condemns user modifications, but this is what Frick does all day. It'll just mean resetting the droid to factory settings, and that's no loss at all. By the way, when was the last time you had your 3PO unit's memory erased? If you don't wipe them regularly, they can get quite peculiar. This is the other reference, a reference to the very first Star Wars movie. After buying two droids, Owen Lars tells Luke to have 3PO's memory erased. It never happens in the end, except after the prequels. I'm placing these droids in your care. Treat them well, clean them up, have the protocol droids mind wiped. What? <laughs> oh no. It's clear in A New Hope that 3PO doesn't remember everything the same way R2 does. A memory wipe is a good way to pull off a fake death scene for him. What are you doing there, 3PO? Taking one last look, sir, at my friends. You want to put what in my head? Under no circum- Memory restoration complete. But instead of a foolhardy legal excuse, have something the audience sees differently from the characters. Where we think, oh, that's like jailbreaking or rooting a phone, the characters are outraged. You mean we have everything to save the galaxy, but a company's greed has stopped us. Frick. Hey Frick, can you circumvent the DRM and install this for us? Bobby Frick, can you help us with this? One particularly baffling idea extends throughout the entire movie. A character says, there's no time, which prevents any further questions from being asked. There's no time to think, otherwise the audience might start noticing things. We can't wait that long. We don't have the time. The time has come! Oh, I'm sorry, is this a bad time? In A New Hope, there is one countdown. It starts at 30 minutes, until the Death Star gets a clear line of sight. Ticking timers are not a very common feature of Star Wars. They can exist, but it would be strange and remarkable. Let's see what JJ uses for the timing mechanism. Remember, this is the foundation to the movie. Everything that happens is an attempt to stop this clock. We've decoded the intel from the First Order spy, and it confirms the worst. Somehow Palpatine returned. Dark science. Cloning. Secrets only the Sith knew. He's the largest fleet the galaxy's ever known. In 16 hours, attacks on all free worlds begin. In this scene, you can almost see the writer's hand twisting the dial to 16 hours. Soon, an enemy fleet will begin to attack the territory of the good guys. That part is absolutely fine. In the original trilogy, the Death Star went from one shot per day to one every few minutes. JJ feels his responsibility is to make something bigger. Start with a planet-sized Death Star shotgun that shoots through hyperspace. End with the biggest fleet ever, where every Star Destroyer has a Death Star super laser. Forgive me, sir, but these allies on Exegol, they sound like a cult. Conjurers and soothsayers. They've conjured legions of Star Destroyers. The Sith fleet will increase our resources 10,000 fold. Also, there's a ticking clock now. The galaxy is going to end this afternoon. Imagine there are no planet-destroying super lasers in play. Not a one. Or if you really insist, we can accommodate just one. You see, Palpatine and has returned before. before. After the first Death Star was destroyed, the Emperor executed the man who designed it. Everyone knows who allowed such a flaw to exist. That's right, none other than... Bevel Lemelisk. He's the one with the eyepiece, not the devilishly handsome chap. I'm sure Mads is a delightful actor to work with, but he just isn't relevant to the history of the Death Star. I shall deal with him later. Bevel oversaw the creation of the Death Star prototype, built near Kessel, to prove the super laser could work. The prototype had the same 120 km diameter as the first Death Star, but was only a skeletal frame. The prototype had little more than a reactor and main cannon, which were also less powerful than the final version. Nor did it have hyperdrives, or crew quarters, or cells to keep your collection of princesses in. After the prototype was proven, the real Death Star began construction in the Horrors system. Back to our man Bevel, who has just died in the most painful way the Emperor can think of, and he can imagine quite a bit. Bit of a waste though, losing such a talented mind. 
The second Death Star was designed soon afterwards, with Bevel working even harder in his newly cloned body. Just six years after the Battle of Endor, in the year 10 ABY, the Emperor was reborn. Having just defeated Grand Admiral Thrawn, the New Republic recaptured a vast swath of the galaxy. This was all part of the cloned Palpatine's plan. His fleet swept in and attacked when the Republic's military was occupied. In this case, he came from deep in the core of the galaxy. He had created a new command vessel, a super star destroyer in a class of its own, the Eclipse, immense, painted black for no reason other than to make its enemies afraid. The Victory class star destroyer, the small one that can operate below orbit, is one kilometer long. The original Imperial Star Destroyer is one mile long, and so are the Imperial Twos. The original Super Star Destroyer, the Executor, is 8 kilometers long. Get on with it? Fine. The Eclipse is 17.5 kilometers long, 10 miles of ship. One of the minor features on it are gravity well generators, or, to use another term for the same device, hyperspace inhibitors. Just as you can't use or enter hyperspace within a planet's gravity well, these gravwell generators do the same for the Eclipse. Its chief weapon is fear, fear and surprise. Oh, and one other thing. By taking the longest straight line in the ship, Palpatine was just barely able to cram a super laser into a spinal mount. This devastating weapon is fully two-thirds of the power of the original Death Star's one. It can't annihilate a planet completely. The prototype of the Death Star could, only, destroy the core of a planet, and the most Eclipse can do is crack the crust of the planet. That's enough reason to have the special effects shot of a beam devastating a planet. Naturally, Luke Skywalker tracked down and slew Palpatine, then destroyed the cloning tanks. Not before Palpatine slipped away, wearing one last clone body that had been in the vat for only 15 years. Technically, this one died by his own hand, when Leia and Luke destabilized a force storm Palpatine had been summoning. The Eclipse was destroyed in the force storm, as was this clone body. The next clone and the Eclipse too? A good question for another time. A good question for another time. Let's use this. We give Emperor Palpatine a new clone body and the Eclipse, also a large fleet of Star Destroyers. The one thing we don't allow JJ to have is the super lasers. He gets to have just one and it's nowhere near the size and power of the original. Besides, JJ only blows up one planet in the whole movie. Instead of a billion Star Destroyers that can blow up a planet each, just have one really big one, and a large but reasonable fleet of ordinary Star Destroyers. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant. Why did JJ add Death Star Super Lasers to every Star Destroyer? Surprisingly, it has nothing to do with the power of that planet-killing cannon. The reason is that JJ knows his fleet is too large. His squillion Star Destroyers would prevail over any opposition. It's insane! It's insane! <laughs> to fix this, a normal person would reduce the size of the invasion fleet. The solution JJ came up with was to make every ship a million times more deadly. Why would you do this? We think hitting the cannons might ignite the main reactors. That's our chance. We need to put some holdo maneuvers, do some real damage. Come on, that move is one in a million. Bugs to Fighters. That's where Lando and Chewie come in. They'll take the Falcon to the core systems. Send out a call for help for anybody listening. We've got friends out there. They'll come if they know there's hope. First Order wins by making us think we're alone. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. Leia never gave up. And neither will we. We're gonna show them we're not afraid. The Star Destroyer fleet has been equipped with the most powerful weaponry the galaxy has ever seen. For exactly one reason. The only role they serve is as a force multiplier. No, not that kind of the force. Just military might. The super lasers are not intended for this. Blast from a Star Destroyer. A ship from the new Sith fleet. The Emperor Out. sent a ship from Exegol. Does that mean every ship in the fleet has, has planet killing weapons? Of course they do. All of them. This is how he finishes it. Destroying planets is not their purpose, it is a pretext, an excuse to install a device needed by the plot. They are intended to solve this issue. Oh, 
my friends. I'm sorry. I thought we had a shot. It's not your fault, Poe. You weren't responsible for this situation. The one who put you up against far too many Star Destroyers was JJ, because he thought it looked cool. And the only way you survived is because JJ was watching over you. Hit those underbelly cannons! Everyone we knock out is a world saved! After creating such an unbalanced fight, one where there is no hope of victory, JJ rebalances it. Now he has his thumb on both sides of the scale. The finale plays out with constant nudges to keep it on course. The only reason the planet-killing guns exist is to be a vulnerability. Well, the Empire doesn't consider a small one-man fighter to be any threat, or they'd have a tighter defense. With a big gun slung out of the hangar, one starfighter can beat a Star Destroyer, it's so the inspirational militia can win at all. Without this Achilles heel, Palpatine would have won. One more thing, logistics. The ticking clock says that in 16 hours, the galaxy will be destroyed. But that's when the fleet gets ready to leave its shipyard. That's not when the bad things happen. Surely, some planets are closer to Exegol, and they'll be destroyed right away. But other star systems are on the far side of the galaxy, so Palpatine's fleet won't arrive until a bit later there would be a slow process of the fleet advancing through the free systems of the galaxy. By taking out the super lasers, we have a very interesting situation. The Emperor's fleet has to actually fight its battles. There will be a front line, combat both in space and on the ground. There would be a war amongst the stars. If J.J. Abrams had made different decisions, there could have been Star Wars. At every turn, J.J. has done everything he can to prevent Star Wars from happening. He's, uh, uh, clumsy. To prevent each battle within that war, every encounter is one-sided. The super laser destroys any planet without a land battle, or it kills the Star Destroyer without a space battle. Instead of a front line moving as territory is lost, it's just a timer. In 16 hours, the galaxy is all destroyed at once, with no travel time. <laughs> There's even a timer to wipe out the fleet. Taking off is the only window to attack. If the fleet gets up to space, shields will make it too hard to hit the weak point. Imagine if the movie had been built on a Star War, where Palpatine's fleet is advancing across the galaxy. The progress is inexorable, the situation hopeless. There is no risky. The good guys can't win even one battle, let alone the Star War. The most they can do is delay long enough to evacuate a planet, if they're lucky. It's not that every second gets you closer to the end of the galaxy. For that second, trillions of sapient beings suffer under Imperial rule. That's bad enough, don't you think? Using a ticking clock for your story is clumsy and inelegant. We're approaching the planet Yavin. The rebel base is on a moon on the far side. We are preparing to orbit the planet. Velocity. The moon with the rebel base will be in range in 30 minutes. This will be a day long remembered. It has seen the end of Kenobi, and will soon see the end of the Rebellion. When a countdown was used in the original Star Wars movie, it wasn't by choice. Stand by alert. Death Star approaching. The Rebel base will be in firing range in seven minutes. About 20 guns. Some on the surface, some on the tower. Death Star will be in range in five minutes. That decision was made while editing the movie, so a timer was all they could manage. Evacuate? In our moment of triumph? I think you overestimate their chances. Rebel base three minutes and closing. The Death Star has cleared the planet. The Death Star has cleared the planet. Rebel base in range. You may fire when ready. But worst of all is that a better opportunity was already set up. Adding the 16-hour clock was unnatural. The movie wanted to be about an interstellar war, but it was clumsily diverted. Further, this war is so compelling, it could have held up an entire trilogy. It's not just the end of three movies, it's the end of nine movies. There's a lot to uh, consider. You have paid the price for your lack of vision. Imagine it. The Emperor's fleet extended across half a galaxy, 
and the resistance fleet concentrated into a single spearhead strike force. Even with this advantage, it goes from the Star Destroyers winning quickly to them winning slowly. That is the strongest resistance the good guys can manage. The only hope of victory is a decapitation strike. Assassinate the reborn Emperor. Strike me down with all of your hatred. Then the entire movie is about the journey to that, and news of the war grinding on in the meantime. We are sure you know the deep YouTube lore. Do the like, bell icon, and subscribe thing. If you are feeling extra kind, perhaps you might even leave a comment. Engagement and such, you know the drill. It gets a little lonely when you are manning an Imperial outpost in the middle of nowhere. Some of the local wildlife ran away with our Dejaric board a few days back. Can Womp Rats even play Dejaric? And we ran out of blue milk weeks ago. Things are looking a little grim. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! My tricks don't work on me, only money. No money, no parts, no deal. 